And uh, okay, sounds good. So um, we created this technology that allowed kids to draw and mimic facial expressions on the 3D character. And in one of the many, many sessions that we had, um, we had a, a kid, his name was Joao, that suffered from severe autism. He couldn't even hardly grab, you know, his dad had to grab his hand to be able to, to draw the expressions. And at the end of the session, Joao started to smile. And that changed the way I would do research for me forever. But what was most impactful that day was that his dad actually asked if he could take the application with him. So it was 2010, tablets had just came out, right? And we said, yeah, sure, but, but what would you do? If it, this is meant for kids. And he says, no, I am gonna be using the digital character to communicate with my son. So he was actually gonna be drawing on the character to tell his son who could not communicate how he was feeling. And that had changed the way I would do research and the reason why we were creating digital characters pretty much forever. And so since then, been trying to find out new ways on how people will interact. And it was only until recently, like end of last year, that I start seeing this big tipping, tipping point where lots of people start asking, okay, we need to use digital humans for many variety of reasons. I think we're still on the very early stage. Um, but this graph that shows now that in 60 seconds, people is communicating in every different means, except on a face-to-face -face way. I think someone will have to create a new technology and show how interacting, like what we're doing now, and I can only see two other people, wish I could see more, um, um, has to change, right? So imagine if someone will be reading your email instead of just having uh, just you yourself have to read it. How can we put emotion into the written text an email has, which probably more, more than one of you have suffered the misinterpretation of a written email, right? So th that's what we want to do by automating the creation of digital humans is, is bring a more authentic and empathic way of connecting, okay? So being that said, uh, the whole mission of, for me, is to build digital humans at scale uh, so we can make a, a world a bit more human. How are we going to do that is by creating extremely high quality digital characters by using an automated pipeline and then hopefully having a big enough platform where different developers would be able to go and choose what they need in order to create that character. So hopefully by the end of this session, you will understand each element that is needed to create a 3D character, okay? So the idea is to have this platform that then developers and artists will be able to say, okay, I want a 3D character or a digital human that has a set of textures that have an animation control structure, the way they define it, that it might have a geometry that is compatible with the volumetric capturing system of Microsoft, or it can be used at an Activision video game, right? So uh, the world is moving towards allowing people to create themselves in a fast way, their own content. And a good example would be TikTok, right? So suddenly end users are becoming also content creators. So the question is, how can we give to all these millions of people that want to create the ability to, in our case, create digital characters, right? So in 2016, and I'm just going to read it, I set up into this mission. If you see me looking sites, it's because I have two screens, OK? Uh, it's in a world increasingly intermediate by technology. Our huge mission is to bring that richness of human communication into every online interaction. I, I, day and night, I'm trying to, to answer this question, right? So let's just deep dive into what is needed to create a digital character. So on the right, we have some images of the current state of the art. We have in the bottom, a lightning stage. This is part of the ERA project. And we have Paul de Verbeck inside the lightning stage. So Paul de Verbeck is it's probably one of the, the, the key persons that developed the initial technology to allow digital humans to look how they look today. 
And on top, we have an image from um, Cubic Motion, uh, a combination of, of a project called um, Senua. It's a video game developed by Ninja Theory and technology used by Cubic Motion, uh, the Unreal Engine, uh, and 3D Lateral. And that was presented in 2016, which I believe was a, a turning point of trying to start uh, automating the creation of characters. So in this case, in the bottom, we have the lightning stage to be able to capture all the textures uh, of, the, of the character. And on the top is capturing the animation of the face. In order to create a full character, if we go to a film or game studios, they have to go through this very sequential uh, set of stages. Modeling, which requires creating the geometry of the 3D character, the texturing, which is building all the texture maps in order to um, uh, create the visual look of the character. So we have, for example, the, the color map, which is the base color of the digital human. Then we'll have the normal maps, the displacement map. So tons of different textures maps are needed in order to reproduce the subtleties of how the character will look like. The next step, it's what it's called the rigging step. And it, this is an analogous, analogous to creating uh, the strings of a puppet, right? So we have to create a way on how we will animate that 3D character. So for, for instance, Shrek had over 500, what it's called blend shapes, which is how you would animate the, the different facial expressions of that 3D character. Now imagine if suddenly you created the geometry, you created all the textures, you set up all the control structure, the rig, and then it goes to animation where an animator can either create the animations by procedural, so they can animate keyframe by keyframe or they can do motion capture, but it doesn't matter. They go to the animation and suddenly they see that the nose a little bit doesn't move the way it should move. That is a huge problem because what has happened is the person that created the rig needs to modify or add an additional control, control element. So then the animation could be done in a right way. So every time we add a new animation control or blend shape, we have to test again the whole system, right? So that's you know kind of be like a huge delay. Now imagine another thing that suddenly the art director, and this is a true story, I'm not gonna mention the company because I know this is recorded, but it is a true story. Imagine that there's the art director that suddenly says, I need to have additional triangles around the eye because in the animation process, the eyes didn't move the way they needed to move. So that means adding a few triangles, right here, right here. If we add a few triangles, that means that whoever did the texture to map to the wireframe needs to readjust the texture coordinates for every texture map. And sometimes a 3D character can even have like 15 texture maps, okay? And then of course it goes back to the rigging which it needs to be redone at least in this area because the weight distribution of the animation control that were on the eyes, right, wasn't fitting correctly. So I think you get the point, right? So this is extremely sequential and we didn't even go into the stage of shading, which is the way we were gonna visualize the data in our end users devices, right? So the shading, which is the materials that we want and the way we want the character to look like will completely vary if we're gonna use, look at, at it in a web browser, in a mobile app, if we're gonna be using the Unity engine, the Unreal engine, if we're gonna be using Maya, Blender, if we're gonna be using Arnold as the renderer, if we wanna use it offline. So planning, you know, all the softwares, all the elements that we're gonna be using, planning the way, the morphology we want our character to look like, all these planning, really impacts the way we're gonna look at the characters, right? So what well, we've been working so hard for all these past like 14, 15 years, and we're still at the very early stage of it is to pretty much automate it all, okay? So up until today, we managed to automate all these stages 
and be able to, in, in less than a minute, to upload uh, an image and get as a result a fully animatable 3D character. And the beauty of it is that we can give the art director, the technical director, the capability of defining how they want that geometry, those textures to look like. And we can set that up in, in a cloud engine and then make sure that the character that comes at the end follows the specifications of the, of the artists, right? So this is just an example. So we input the image on the left and then we output what is on the right. Still has some imperfections, right? If it's not exactly the same, that's why, but this could lead to a different discussion, which I'm not gonna deep dive now, unless someone asks me any question at the end, which is, do we want to have an exact copy of us virtually, or do we want a virtual representation? And if we want a virtual representation, do we want it to be more beautiful? And if we want it to be more beautiful, what does actually beautiful means? Because it's a perception of ourselves in our brain, right? So that leads to a completely different area of research. Um, still not getting into that one yet, but I, I think it's an interesting point to highlight because for sure, once creating digital characters becomes something that everyone can do, the next normal step is, okay, how can I make it look more beautiful, depending on what I think is more beautiful, right? So, so far, this is what we can have. And this is how the process would look like from an automated point of view. You can take a mobile phone, you can just take a picture out of it. You can then send that to the cloud automatically process it, get the clean wireframe, as you can see here. So it's not just a point cloud. It's not just raw data. We actually create, and it's very important to create a geometry that follows the muscles and the morphology of the face. So we can clearly see here that you have the orbicularis muscle underneath. So therefore you can put geometry to simulate those muscles if needed, right? Um, if you just have raw, mesh or point cloud, then you would not be able to animate it because that would produce uh, different artifacts. And then finally, once you create the geometry, you also create the control structure and then the render usually happens on the device. Unless you decide to do streaming using 5G and then render can be happening in the cloud as well, right? But that's a software architecture decision. So this is another example just to show how important it is to adapt different morphologies, different skin colors. Um, another challenge is how to set up the hair, right? So when you create digital humans, hair just by itself, it's a, it's a nightmare, right? So the way we solve it in order to have an automated, automatic version is to rely on having a library of hairs so pretty much the method would be you take all the hair out. If, if it's a male, you can also take the hair of the face out and then you put hair back, okay? So that way you have full control of the geometry and the textures of the 3D character. Mm -hmm. um, another important aspect when doing an automatic version because you, you don't have control over everything is normalizing the illumination. So as you can see, if we look at the picture, we have, we see that the, the face is not evenly lit, right? So what, what is important to do in this case automatically is just to normalize. Why that is so important? Because if you then want to use the digital character on a virtual environment, you need to make sure that it adapts to the environment you're putting the 3D character in, right? So. Um, that's what we also work really hard on. It's like normalizing the illumination by eliminating uh, shadows, um, reflections, specularities, okay? And so we can adapt to different skin colors. And then another important thing is even though I'm, I'm focusing on the face, then is how do I extend the skin color from the face to the rest of the body? 
So here I have a very subtle, small uh, animation. So as I said, when it comes out of the, of, the, of the cloud, we have a full rig underneath. So it's a very subtle animation. Couldn't find another one that I could use publicly. And I, and I knew this was going to be recorded. So if you look at the, the, the eyes and the little mouth, it just really moves very subtly. Um, I'll just play it again. But you could place any animation. This animation was actually created using, we have a mockup app that we implemented and we created using the AR kit. So we can actually grab the AR kit, motion capture, map it into the 3D character, and then off you go, you can play it. Other things that you could do is once you have the 3D character is just to plug the 3D character into any text to speech te technology, like a Google technology or like Amazon Poly. So the, the, it's very important that when you create the control structure of your, of your character, you make sure you also create all the biasings of the face so you can do proper speech animation, right? So in this case, we have over 256 blend shapes, I think, some of them dedicated just to the visual speech. Uh, when you do visual speech, there are other things that you need to consider. One is the co-articulation problem. So usually when you're animating a 3D character and you get some text in and you translate the text into the biosims, you want to make sure that you avoid the 3D character to hopefully people can see what I what I will do, but it's like do like this. Hello, I am Veronica. You need to avoid that. That's called the core articulation problem. So we've implemented a set of algorithms that we can estimate what is called the weight between the biosims and um, animate the 3D character. Someone that is really expert probably in this area might be wondering, okay, but how do I really, really replicate the behavior, right? So up until now, I've only spoken about visual representation of the morphology, okay? I haven't deep dive into the behavior. So we haven't yet cracked the behavior or implemented how to solve behavior. And by behavior, I mean, how can I do the representation of my own self, how I speak, how I move my face into a digital character, right? So that's the next stage. Uh, because when you're solving for the uncanny valley, you have to solve for two things. One thing is how do I look in static mode and how do I look in movement? And after you solve the static mo mode and after you solve the movement, you need to say, if, it, if I really want it to be me, it needs to move like myself. So what we intend to do afterwards is just uh, being able through video capturing or computer vision and machine learning techniques to extract um, micro expressions from each person's face um, and then replicate those mi micro expressions as a subset of those blend shapes in order to be able to trigger them when you're animating. I hope everyone had followed me on what I said, but if not, again, please feel free to drop questions. So the example that you saw here, this is, um, this is what comes out of the package uh, from the cloud that gives you the digital character and it's being rendered using Play Blast using Maya. Uh, we use facial animation retargeting from the mockup, as I explained, uh, but at the end of the day, it's an FBX file, so you could plug it in into the Unreal Engine Unity engine or, or so on. What is, why am I highlighting? Because when you create these digital characters, it's really important that you can use it cross platforms, unless you have really well planned the whole production of where you're gonna be using your characters. So it goes back to the beginning of the presentation when I, say, I highlighted each stage. So you really need to know, not just the outcome, of what you want to have, in this case, an FBX 3D character with a rig, but also where that 3D character is going to be living after you created it. Okay. And again, highlighting once you create the 3D character, the, the rendering quality and the shading quality will depend a lot in the engine that you will use. So, for example, this image here is used, it was generated using Marmoset, which is a real time. Um, uh, player just to display 3D objects, and this was just plain natural uh, Maya. So there are other things that we've been working on, and uh, so so far I showed you and I explained you what you do when you get a, a single 
selfie and you create a 3D character. But technology has been evolving and we have other ways on creating extremely higher quality digital humans. So one is using depth camera. Um, and in this case, we we've used the iPhone um, and capture just one selfie with depth from a mannequin. OK, so I just wanted to show that it, it also works out well with uh, non-realistic humans as long as they have the topology of a face, like two eyes, a mouth and a, 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 and a nose. OK, this is work in progress. Hopefully we'll have I, I was wishing that iPhone uh, would have its own scanner, but they didn't. So we decided to implement ours. Um, and then the next one is photogrammetry data. So in this case, in the depth camera is automatically generated, so we can we can do it automatically. The photogrammetry results usually takes us um, a few hours uh, to obtain this result, which is better than weeks and weeks still. Okay. So and I will explain this process in in detail further down the pre presentation. So uh, I wanted to show you an end to end how it works. So in this case was a project we did with uh, Sony and uh, with Sony, Sony had uh, a scanner on their mobile phone. And so it generated this raw mesh, right? So if you want, as I said, if you want to animate this raw mesh, it would be pretty much impossible because it doesn't have a mouse. It doesn't have the eyes. And on top of everything, the geometry does not follow the morphology of the face, right? So it will look really good if you want to print it out. Uh, extremely, extremely high quality, but take you could not do much more than that. So we did a fantastic project with them, which is we input this raw mesh into our engine, and we would automatically create the clean wireframe and created the eyes and the inside of the mouth, right? And this is a little bit of the of the process. So here you have the raw mesh uh, and the color based uh, texture. So we would only get you know images of their frontal camera, um, the wireframe that we automatically created, and all this done in like less than sixty seconds. In this case, automatically create the eyes through an algorithm that allowed eye color detection, and then. Um, final render with uh, this was a very basic keyframe animation, which is wanted to test it. We didn't have the mockup uh, system back then, so it was all um, created by hand by keyframe animation. They were very interested in the eyes. How can we recreate the eyes? So this is um, uh, what we did, but I think it shows clearly the, the full process. Right. So. Um, hold on. Okay. So in terms of the depth camera uh, and with the iPhone, uh, I what I wanted to highlight with this slide is, okay, we can do 360 all around and check out, I don't know if it's feasible to see, the level of detail of the number of, of triangles you get. So the challenge in this stage, it's called the registration process, and is how from this w combination of millions of triangles and I'm skipping a step right the previous step is the point cloud from the point cloud you need to create a geometry we get this geometry with this much detail and we still need to know that what we're getting is a face right so that problem by itself is already complicated so you have here the point cloud then you have the geometry generated and this is just a a glimpse of uh, some early, early, early results. As you can see, the, the quality that you can get with a point cloud, uh, and we call it the depth camera swapping, it's uh, much more accurate than just a selfie. So this is a personal opinion. I think uh, more and more mobile phones are going to have the capability of extracting this point cloud, so therefore, they would be able to generate more accurate and precise method. And also highlights the flexibility of having an engine that you can add, you can put different type of inputs and it will still be able to recognize it and generate a quality 3D character to the end. 
So the last step is what is photogrammetry, right? So photogrammetry is the capability of, of getting many pictures. So in this case, uh, it's different than from what we're doing with the point cloud. So we get many, many pictures. And through those pictures, you reconstruct and you create a geometry out of it. So uh, we created this method. I think it was around, the first version was around 2012, I think. So we did uh, in 2012, we replicated the lightning stage that I showed at the beginning from Paul de Bebeck uh, by using one Canon camera in um, motion capture studio because the, the walls were all white and reflectant. So the illumination was perfect. And we took, I think about like, uh, if I'm not mistaken, like 30 something images in, in less than a minute. So someone had to go around, take the images. We collected all those images. We put it into our reconstruction method and did the rigid registration and automatically generate a geometry. And then it goes back to the next step on the pipeline. So we get here, as you can see, a, a, a wireframe similar to the one that I showed before. It's, it's a little difficult to see, but if you, if you zoom in, it's like tons of triangles, but again, they do not follow the morphology of the, of the face, right? So it goes back again into the main process of sending those triangles, understanding that it's a face and generating a clean, a clean geometry. In this case, as you can see, we had the eyes closed, right? Because back then we did not know how to reconstruct this area of the face if we would not capture it. So now through a combination of machine learning algorithms, we are able to reconstruct this part of the face even if we're not capturing it, okay? But back then we needed to take the pictures with the eyes closed to, for accuracy. And these are uh, a few more examples. So this is the setup that we have today. So we are actually, we've improved it a little bit. It's still not a lightning stage, okay? But it's very cheap. Uh, we have three cameras. We just have a rotating chair with just post-its. So the person is what rotates instead of rotating the camera. And this can be replicated. You can have like a turntable, right? A, a professional studio will have a turntable with the person in the middle, just rotate that turntable and just take all the pictures with a very flat illumination, right? Then that then, then data comes into the engine. You create a first pass of the raw mesh. Uh, as you can see, it's non-organized triangles, create a clean geometry. And finally, you can reproduce the shading with different type of illumination. In terms of the texture map and shading, usually we create several textures. I'm only showing three of the many textures that you can produce, but it's pretty much to do normal map, displacement map, specularities, and, and, and so on. So what you're doing in a very rough way is taking away all the illumination, right? Getting like really flat color base uh, on, the, on the texture. So then you can put back all the illumination again, okay? And this is an example of exactly what I was actually saying. This is uh, one of the photos of the 30, 30 photos that we took, create the retopology, first step, the albedo color texture. So we put polar, we had on the lens a polarized uh, filter. So it will uh, neutralize the, the, the light. Then you create the displacement and normal maps. Now getting into the shading, you will do uh, subsurface scattering, a specularity, transmission of the light, especially on the ears, the nose, these areas, and the mouth. And then finally, you can do physically based render because you have a super spectacular 3D character that can adapt to any lightning environment. So if I do a little bit of a recap, so in each step of the creation of the 3D character, you have to really think of a way that then the character can be reused in any environment. So on the modeling, you have to follow the morphology of the face. So you can replicate the muscles movements. 
in terms of the textures, you got to be able to create all the texture maps that would allow for not just the color of the texture representation, but also all those additional details, uh, like little bumps that we all have on the face, and so you do the displacement maps and, and, and normal maps. Um, then on the when, when you set up the control structure, which is the rig, you got to make sure that it's prepared for behavior so that it will be able to reproduce every micro and macro facial expression. And then finally, the animation can be done either keyframe or motion capture or procedural. I haven't spoken about procedural. And then finally, you got to decide the engine where you want your 3D character to, to be displayed because that will have a lot of impact in the type of the rendering that quality that you will get. Okay, So um, this is uh, was done on the Unreal Engine. Uh, so this is Unreal Engine quality, right? And it's the same in one of the 34 photos using photogrammetry technique, uh, same character under different uh, illumination setup on the Unreal Engine. Good. So um, if I give you the example of the rig, this is uh, our base rig um, that we use. Uh, very, very sophisticated, over 490 joints, 320 something blend shapes. It is compatible with the facial action coding system. So if you're using a mock-up system that is supports the facial action coding system, it works. And then um, we can embed all this into the Unity SDK. One very important issue is that in this case is the rig that we are using, but I like to highlight that usually different companies have their own different rigs uh, and their own different geometries and their own different way of doing the texture mapping. So if you ever want to build up an automated system, you can either say, okay, users, you're gonna be using my system the way I created, or you, want, you, you can take it one step further and said, okay, I'm gonna create a system that would allow my users, which in this case are artists or technical directors to define how they want to use it. So that, that was probably my biggest learning when I was doing my PhD. So I that was in 2005, four, four, yeah, I can't remember. Um, and that was one of the things that I learned the most. I spent about a year and a half trying to understand what the problem was. And I when finally I understood the artist that say, no, 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 but I don't want to use the rig the way you set it up. I need this feature. And then I would talk to another artist and they say, no, no, I need this other feature. So that's when I, I thought, okay, I need to create a method that is, um, it doesn't really matter how I, how I create the rig. What it matter, matters is how my user is going to create it. And that's when that was my pretty much my PhD thesis. It's just a uh, geometric deformation algorithm that allowed anyone creating any type of rig and transferring to another place. And that lesson that I learned back then, it's pretty much the premise that I continue applying in all the, in all the research that we kept on doing when developing this facial animation system. Oh, sorry, I didn't show you the animation <laughs> of the rig. So it's extremely flexible. It's, it's a parametrized rig. So that means that we can manipulate every single corner of the face, okay? Um, one other thing that I can probably mention about setting up a facial animation rig is that the, the, the reason this is parameterized is because it will work in any facial model. And by any facial model, I mean any face that have different morphologies. So I'll give you an example. Again, this is a real example. Uh, a few years ago, many years ago, um, I did the facial rig for The Simpsons um, that is at Universal Studios. And the task was we had only three days to create all the facial rig. And what happened initially is they sent me uh, one of the characters from The Simpsons and they said, you need to transfer all these blend shapes into all the other Simpsons character. So now imagine if I would take all the control structure, all the blend shapes, all the facial expressions from Homer and put them into Maggie. So suddenly we will have Maggie speaking like Homer, all right? 
So of course, I mean, the transfer by default would have been perfect, but it would not fulfill the expected expectations, which is Maggie can outspeak like Homer, right? So this is just to highlight that even when you're talking about rigs, um, again, it's important to understand which is the context and where you're gonna use them. So, because morphology and behavior really matters. So the solution back then was we had, we end up having two, right? One for Homer styles and the other one for, for Maggie styles, right? Um, so that's why in this case, this rig is completely parametrized because then you can change different weights at the different areas of the face and then it, it will adapt to, it will be more versatile to adapt to different type of characters. So in terms of rendering, this is just to, to give you a, a glimpse of the different qualities. Really, it, it's a whole world by its own. I'm not gonna get into shading, um, but depending how strong and, and depending on the quality of the render, you will get different qualities, right? Um, we're working on a web player, uh, which is very limited. Depending on the, <clears throat> on the web browser that you're using, you will have one quality or another. For example, if you are using Chrome in PC, you can support, for instance, subsurface scattering. But if you're using Safari on mobile, you will not be able to do subsurface scattering. So in subsurface scattering is the, what I explained before is the transparency on the ears, the nose, and the mouth. So um, again, you know, when you decide to do render and shading, it's really important to decide and understand the the advantages and disadvantages of each platform. So this is just an example of uh, real-time hair. As you can see, real-time hair, especially here, um, it has its own uh, limitations. Um, the real-time hair needs to move in a different way. The rendering, uh, yet I don't think it's at the level of an offline uh, renderer. So. Um, still, this is one of the things that offline rendering is still better than real-time rendering, even using the Unreal Engine. Okay. Um, in this case, it's just to highlight the different types of shadings. So in this case, it's just to show the subsurface scattering, especially if we look at here in the ears, right? And in this case, is real-time shaders in Maya. So the reason these images in this slide is because when you're working, everyone thinks of Maya as a software for offline rendering, but Maya can also be used for real-time rendering and artists uh, more and more, they, they, they ask for it because so they can see what they're doing while they are implementing it. In our case, we're using Maya uh, for real-time shading because uh, we're creating our own rendering pipeline. And what does this mean? It means that our default place for testing the quality of our digital characters is within Maya. Uh, but then what we want to have is an automatic, automated um, rendering pipeline system that if you output the shaders that come out of Maya, then automatically we can import all those shader materials into Unity, Unreal, WebGL, whatever. Because otherwise, you need to implement for each engine the shaders, okay? So that's also um, important to know. Okay, as, you, as there's so much to implement <laughs> to implement to automate the, the the system. Right. So as we thought, faces were never enough. You know, we thought, okay, why not getting into bodies? Right. So you don't have a digital human if you don't have a body. So what we, this is uh, very, fairly simple, really. Uh, we created uh, our generic female and male bodies, and we have a, a method and an algorithm that allows you to configure the bodies however you wish in an extremely fast way within Maya. Um, so this is really useful if you wanna do body measurements. So someone can input a file and tells you the body measurements and we can automatically create a 3D character body shape of it okay so also we have a method a method that once you create automatically the head then you have to stitch the head into the body okay so that's also another set of steps 
So I, I'm highlighting this detail because as you can see from research all the way to building, building something that can actually be used out of the box by uh, um, content creator person, just this, a lot of detail that need to be taken into consideration. Okay. Um, uh, this slide is misplaced, should have been a little bit before. This is um, our part of our real uh, offline um, uh, hair library. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to get into the details on how to create hairs because I can probably spend here a lot of time on it. Uh, just to highlight that, to, just to create one of these hairs, it can take up about of one person at least three weeks. That's how complex it is just to create hair. So what we created was with the artist that works with, with us, who's fantastic, um, a method that you create kind of like cup hairs. And then from that, we can do small variations, kind of like a hair saloon. But still, if you would have to create from scratch one hair, which take at least three weeks of a full time, ex very experienced artist. It's, it's really complex to do good hair. And these are a few more hairs from our hair library. These are these are all offline render hairs. Okay, as I said, big difference between offline and real time. So, in terms of user experience, I don't think I have time to um, talk a, a lot about the user experience. Uh, but um, just want to highlight again what I said a little bit before: when you create your digital human, our whole mission is to give people the possibility of creating a representations of themselves. So how can I create a user experience that would enhance this belief that is not a copy of you, it's a representation of you. And I believe that that is all about the user experience. So there could be a full conversation just around that, but just keep that in mind is how through a user experience, I can create an engaging and immersive uh, tool that would allow for the representation of myself that I will like. Uh, where we are today. So I think we have on one hand, you know, Facebook cartoonish type of style of characters. And then on the other hand, we have extremely photogrammetry extensive and time intensive photogrammetry 3D characters. We have to, we, 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 there's a space in the middle that if someone can crack the possibility of creating these high quality digital humans fast, then, uh, a huge new industry will open because there is out there a lot of people that wants just to create content. Okay. So just a few use cases and we have, I think we have 10 more minutes. I, I don't know if someone can tell me how the session really runs is do we uh, do we do questions or I don't know. Someone can tell me. Uh, yes, usually we have questions. I have a lot of questions. <laughs> With okay. this presentation, you really touched my heart. <laughs> okay. So I, I mean, I can continue. Just like stop here because I, I only have. I was going to talk about a little bit about fashion, but I can, I can, I can skip that if we want to do questions. Example. It says. Let me. Yeah. This is just uh, putting it together, the digital humans with fashion and how garments would, would be implemented, but that's also a huge topic by itself. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, and this is a little bit about the sports and the photogrammetry that we did. Uh, yeah, I, th I think it's about it. I, I don't need to probably deep dive in this. If you, I think questions are more important. Um, this is another project on fashion where you can put the, your own face and, and just experience um, different way on, on dressing, yeah, yourself. Yep. So I can, I think I can stop here. So I give you 10, 12 minutes of, uh, of questions if that's okay. Or someone else wants questions. Thank you uh, so much, Veronica. So the session is open for questions. Okay, uh, I'm Pia Tikka. Hi, hi, Veronica. Hi. Um, I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, this is exactly what uh, what uh, we've been struggling uh, in on, on our part of the world, which is Estonia-Finland collaboration. Uh, 
So uh, we uh, we also uh, created a kind of a fast pipeline for for our current uh, characters that we are using. But uh, but the fact is that that um, that this kind of uh, automated systems are really in need. Like now talking from the side of the content creators, like filmmakers, like myself, uh, and and storytellers, plus then all the possible applications in the in the societal uh, societal applications, whatever there are. So um, and so yes. Uh, very very interesting uh, good uh, good presentation thank you I, I wanted to ask something about the the nor normalized map the, oh, okay. the so I'm not expert in so there's somebody else who's who's been working with me Victor Pardino on on like creating creating these uh, characters uh, and this pipeline that we are using but uh, but I'm, I'm curious about this uh, this um, uh, normalized map like uh, that. Uh, okay, you have a param param parametrized uh, mesh that yes. that you apply to all the characters. So, uh, is this mesh um, does it adapt uh, also like to the persons like the different shape of the face? Yeah, that, that's the whole idea. Yeah. So, so it's a geometric. The, the core behind it is a geometric deformation algorithm combined with a uh, machine learning and computer vision techniques. So pretty much if you input a photo, what we do is we detect tons of, land, of landmarks on the face. So then the geometry uh, that we create for that 3D model, so the 3D representation of the chitty mesh really just adapts to the face um, uh, measurements. If you input a depth uh, image, then we can also read depth information and in areas like the nose is extremely improved. But yes, the, the whole purpose is that it really just adapts to the face. It's not a sticker on a geometry. Mm. Because, uh, because I was just uh, thinking of the, of the, because some of the characters that had a like, like wider chin, yeah, like, they like, actually had a narrow skin, I mean chin, or, or uh, like bigger nose. So uh, are these, are these, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So mm. here, and if I show you, and you can see like the detail, like here, the, the t even the texture. So if you see here in the, in the eye and, and here, mm. you know, and if you look at it, it like really just adopts even the, even we even created displacement maps on the textures. So then it will deform accordingly. And if I look for like another model to so see, like even from here to that one, you can see how it narrows down to the shape and the nose, the nose is extremely different. And the mouth, the size of the lips. So, see? And the size of the eyes. Now let's just look at the eyes. Mm. Uh, what mm. we don't do with a selfie is the ears. Ears, so the ears remain almost the same. Uh, as we change the skin color, uh, it's just not that noticeable, but uh, um, with a selfie, the ears is not possible. But the, the, the eyebrows, just look at the eyebrows as well. I mean, the whole geometry of, of the region is very different. So here. Yep. Uh, yeah, so we've improved significantly the, the algorithm for deformation. We don't do uh, any of the new techniques that is just uh, neural networks and all that, we don't. It's just purely really emphasizing geometric deformation algorithms. Yeah. Um, yeah, I hope I answer that. <laughs> yeah. I, I have an uh, other just a point to make that uh, you mentioned about the behavior. So yes. uh, this is this is now the topic that uh, that uh, in Tallinn University, I'm I'm working with my collaborators. We are and actually uh, collaborators. Oh, sorry, yes. So uh, on 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 like uh, machine learning of the of the behavior of the face. Uh, mm -hmm. So so, so I, I would love to talk more about in detail. Uh, we cannot yeah, so, discuss so, everything now, but uh, but I, I will be sending you an email. Yeah, introducing please, myself do, and we, maybe do, we can do talk. Reach out, do reach out because as I said. Uh, Behavior for us is the next uh, big frontier. 
So we, we have a lot of um, research that we've done on the past, um, but in order to actually build it into a comprehensible product, like the way we are doing with just the first, the representation, we're still a little bit, you know, maybe like eight months um, away from it. Um, our goal is to be able to extract the micro details of the face when you talk. And then by extracting those micro details, we will create all those blend shapes that we already have, like really adapt them to those micro details that we have extracted. So there is research that even I have done in my past on these micro blend shapes. So I know it's possible. We just haven't really implemented it in, in, in this version yet. It, looking, looking forward to then. then. It's, it's, it's gonna be a very difficult, expensive, and a lot of people will have to work on it. <laughs> but, but this is exactly my, my interest in the field is, is that, uh, that um, most of the expressions that we have when we co have a conversation so we, we, we more focus on a small, very, very subtle uh, changes, little changes in the eyes. And, and, and that from those we read from others, others' faces that how they respond to us if, if uh, our proposal is rejected or if there's a suspiciousness or whatever. And I mean, almost still face, but little changes and, and that changes like totally the, the feel yeah. of, of, and, I, and communication. So this is really, agree. yeah, I, I completely agree. I wouldn't agree more. Um, and I think the challenge is, do we want, and I don't know, this is an open question that comes to my mind. Do we want to have those micro expressions that really represent us or could we still represent the same meaning by a set of predefined, kind of like predefined micro expressions that would represent the meaning, but it wouldn't represent the way I would express it. I don't know if I'm making my sense clear. Um, like a generalized, generalized. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, my my mouse goes like this now. I'm I like generalized. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I think we can deal with a lot of uh, uh, like generalized uh, expressions, uh, but then then there's something there like then on a pers personalized yeah. level that how can how can that then be added on top of the kind well, of the kind of default behavior well we already have the geometry that represents the face of that person so a potential combination to take you there would not solve it completely but it could be a mid-step let's just say right uh, yes. it's an interesting i mean uh, all these that i'm saying now please just take it with a grain of salt because I haven't really tested it or anything. It's just like hypothesis, right, at this stage. Yeah. Well, we are dreaming. We are, we are walking in the future, but we still have to struggle with the technology of today. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. You, have a, uh, you have a question on the chat. Uh, I don't oh. know. I didn't see it. see it. I don't even hey, know what Veronica, great presentation. Do you have experience in the body? Yeah. Diego, all right. Uh, do you have experience in body scanning through the imaging to improve sport training, to improve real movements versus technical ones? Oh, okay. That's a great question. Actually, we work with a company uh, that they, they do uh, body sports analytics. So the name of the company is called FanView. Um, and uh, with them, we do the body scanning um yeah uh so they give us literally the, the the photogrammetry images we create the body and the face uh but they do then they have other partners that they work with and they do um sports analytics yeah fan view it's called the name of the company yeah, yeah. Can i i have also a question yeah uh, i have actually uh few questions, but I will stick to one because of the lack of time. Uh, we, I just want to say that with Jean-Philippe and Gregory in SSVAR, we have also a similar project for uh, creating digital human twins. And the idea that will uh, be exactly like us, 
uh, they will, in some sense, our uh, continues to 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 be alive after our death. And there are such kind of company already. It's called Eternim, I call one, and they are also Oven, which has similar subjects. Yeah. And uh, what when we work on that, we stick a major problem because it it's very easy to make a high reproduction of somebody with a photogrammetry, for example, but then to animate this in real time on a mobile dev device is very complicated stuff because of a lack of resources. Uh, and uh, we come to idea that uh, if you look, uh, for example, many years ago, uh, Disney do a very pretty good job with a very similar, uh, very simple pictures. Uh, Hands, uh, hands uh, uh, made because there was no uh, computers on those times. And uh, the point actually is the uh, relation between the emotion and the expression of this emotion to the pictures. They do a, a beautiful job of uh, uh, um, express the emotion of the characters on a picture. And so the idea is probably we don't really need very high fidelity in, uh, in, uh, in the mesh and in the texture or in the uh, graphical part, but you need really a high fidelity of reproduction of this emotion, emotion of the person yeah. to, uh, to this uh, uh, 3D object. So I don't know if you have some uh, research on this subject or how, how to translate the emotion to the movement uh, of the yeah of the so I so I um, all the research I've always done uh, and my even at my research lab was to the replication or the creation of digital humans in in terms of movement um, but not the emotion analysis okay um, I think that's more on the on the neuroscience, it could be done on the neuroscience side or even on speech, like you could do sentiment analysis through speech. So what we what we created or what we focus is, if someone gives me the emotional vector, and by an emotional vector, I say it can come from anywhere, right? It can come from speech analysis. And I get during this timeline uh, or this length of the speech, there's they are speaking in a mix of happiness with surprise. So I get the, that vector and then I can trigger that into our animation system. And I can say the weight of the facial expressions that is happy and surprise. So I, I've never done research into doing the extraction of the emotions, but more on the representation of the emotion from a visual point of view. Right. Okay, but uh, if I understand well, if you have this emotional vector, we can relate this in a okay. correct way with yeah. the animation you have created. Uh, correct. Our, yes. Yeah, correct. correct. That's exactly correct. Uh, what we've done was uh, facial emo uh, facial expression recognition. So I had a PhD student, one, one of my best PhD students, and we did facial expression recognition with a uh, by recognizing the, the six universal expressions with a 96% of accuracy in pure expressions. So I make, I'm uh, emphasizing pure expressions because it has to be pure happy, pure sad, pure fear, right? And we did that also for the very early stage of the head mounted displays. So we could even detect the facial expression just with half of the face. So um, right. then, yeah, then that was in like, 2000, probably 2012, I think. Uh, and then uh, she finished her PhD. And um, I then we, anyway, uh, but there are ways that it could be done to extract the micro expressions as well. So there is a good book from Scott McLeod, which is a comic writer. And he has one book, I can't remember if it's in Understanding Comics or Making Comics, Scott McLeod. He explained a lot about facial expressions. So what we wanted to do was extend the paper we wrote on geometric extraction of, of pure expressions to then do micro and micro expressions. So I could explain the algorithm was very, was very simple. Uh, 
It's just, um, we draw ellipsoids around the mouth and the eyes and the eyebrows. And then by matching where certain points on the ellipsoid will lie by doing facial landmarking, we will then match it into a database and we will know which expression was. The algorithm is like spot on, really simple. Implemented it in three days. Yeah, it's implemented in three days. I just throw it on the board of my office and um, uh, this student, uh, he implemented. We could do an extension of that version for micro expression and mixed expressions, but I didn't have any PhD students to, to work on. We moved and built the company. So it's a VT, it's still on my head because I know it's possible to do the mixed expressions using the same approach, you know. I don't know, hope, it, hope this helps. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you very much again. Yeah. Some uh, other questions? Well, let's assume this uh, session closed. All Thank right. you very much to all participants and uh, spectators. And uh, see you next time. Yeah. Thank, thank you very you much. much. Thank you for organizing it. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye bye. You're welcome. Bye.